remember Time magazine did a whole thing on the economy in Ireland and entertainment was a big part of it. They had Sean Lamass on the cover and they covered us a big picture in the, inside at the Crystal Ballroom, the queues and inside the people out enjoying themselves, product of a thriving economy. We could have gone on as the back garden of Britain, supplying vegetables to their industry. We could have gone that road, stayed on that road, if you like. Or we could change over and say, we're going for industry. And we're going for not alone the industry that we see, for, for the industry that might come with inventions in our time. We're going to have a modern state. Lots more people, for instance, had started, even at that stage, pre-free education, uh, had started to stay on in secondary education. But more importantly, when they finished that education, they then saw opportunities in places like Erlingas, uh, DSB, or all of these places. I mean, for myself, I started working in Erlingas. Airline travel still seemed exciting then. The greatest need which was seen by the man whom I admire above all men, Sean Lamas, was the need to create employment in Ireland. There are a lot of people in Ireland whose standard of living is one that you uh, or I uh, would feel is impossible, is intolerable. And it is only by developing the economy. And who's to develop the economy except the managers? We came in with a mass, really. Brian Lenehan, Donald Gambali, myself, Paddy Hillary, Kevin Boland, a whole lot of people like that. Uh, and uh, um, we... I suppose we were very much uh, in the Lamas mould, uh, believed implicitly in what Lamas was doing and trying to do, and I suppose we had a new confidence in ourselves. Like there's always an opening for people at different at each ticket, as comes like, and the different people. Up to the last 20 years, so it was always the people that had been in business all their life, their sons carried on the business and expanded businesses. With the modern train now, well, there's no going to depending on what your father did or somebody did before you. The future then was in the building trade, so we decided to expand out into machinery because the government had decided that they should spend a lot of money in land reclamation and road widening and so forth. Then television came. And everything seemed extraordinarily different. The radio just got pushed away. Well, the cameras now leave us here at the Gresham, and we return to Montrose, from which to draw to a close... This we had television just before Malacca shocks, before television Aaron started. And my uncle had it for several years. He was a very advanced and progressive Lamas type man. And we'd go across to his house and sit down and watch all the programs through the snow that was coming in. We'd see terrible things like, what's my line and all this sort of stuff. But when this arrived, it was the reason why so many Irish people got television, because television Aaron was going to be there. And they bought it. Good evening, here is the news. Experts from I must the admit that, that sometimes when I think of television and radio and their immense power, I feel somewhat afraid. We were extremely aware of the amount of imported programs, I remember, especially from America, short half-hour programs. We were also aware that they were quite old, a lot of them were old, and they reflected a society, perhaps from the 1950s, in America. Because I think when you talk about of a television, the importance of television, we mustn't, I don't think, forget the importance of the cinema in educating people visually before that. They knew what America looked like. And the America on TV was a little bit out of date. Live from Television, it's Saturday night. It's The Late Late Show.
television did open quite dramatically the area of acceptable public discussion. It was quite sensational. The uh, subject began to be discussed on television that um, had been under more or less uh, a, a taboo before that. You take advantage of the vulnerable and the young to isolate them and brainwash them into believing that your system is somehow the only way of thinking of living. People, to put their affairs in order so as these things don't happen, and the same thing should have been put Gallop and dash to have a divorce. I'm not afraid to see we are in this And then those men from the five Catholics died and not wait for ten Protestants died. That to me is a very unfair fascist statement. I'm not school at four years old. You can't give it those things. The amazing thing is the number of conflicts that used to arise late on Saturday night around the Late Late Show, largely because people spoke the truth, which in one form or another was unpalatable to, to sectional interest in the, in the Irish community. The most stupid question <laughs> I was ever asked in my life was at 17 years of age, do you have bad thoughts? <laughs> <laughs> we had nothing else but bad thoughts. Maybe they thought it was going to be safe, that it wasn't going to lead them too far astray. And yet it was opening, opening out into another world. That unrelenting boredom and the sort of curse of emigration that I had experienced and my family had experienced in the 1950s was now being challenged by something new, new and energetic, which could be seen in the music, which could be seen in the openness uh, to uh, the international community. And curiously enough, this was coming through the Catholic Church and through other institutions, which again were not noted for their inventiveness. Vatican II is shorthand, of course, for an enormous tidal wave of change that comes over human existence. It was very sensitive to them, but it didn't know how to deal with them. And in that, I would suggest it was not altogether unique. Urbanization, the breakup of local rural communities, the massive growth of communications, in particular, if I may be allowed to mention it here, the way in which television reaches into people's souls. John F. Kennedy's visit to Ireland was, I think, one of the events that anybody who saw it will never forget. It was a big moment of modernity in Ireland. Suddenly we had this modern, glamorous, successful, sexy, tanned, well-dressed individual who was one of our own who came back to visit us. I remember it distinctly. I was uh, 11 at the time and uh, lining the streets of Dublin along with everybody else to see this person who looked as if he came from another planet in some sort of way. It was the return of the golden boy, I suppose, to, to Ireland. It was a way of us validating ourselves. He gave us uh, an enormous sense that anything was possible, that emigration didn't have to end in misery, that it could bring about uh, an enormous measure of success and power in what was and what still is the most powerful country in the world. The major forum for your nation's greater role in world affairs is that of protector of the weak and voice of the small, the United Nations. We must at our peril use all the influence and power at the disposal of the United Nations to close the door of the nuclear club now. No matter how insistently aspiring members I uh, was elected when there were still prominent people who had taken part in the War of Independence and in the Civil War. They were still in the doll, and a transition was taking place uh, to another generation. And uh, that transition wasn't altogether easy uh, because there was a certain friction, I thought often at times, between the older generation uh, and the upcoming one. In 1957 to 59, over half the government were revolutionaries of a period 35 years earlier. In 1965, four Fianna Fáil ministers were still of that period. But that's 40, 43 years after the state was founded. And I think we suffered from the fact that that generation stayed in office so long. Thanks to the people who have gone before us, we were well educated. We got a good education and uh, we could hold our own. Now, a lot of the politicians before us, I think, had been perhaps a little intimidated by uh, the structures that were there. We weren't. Uh, we were quite prepared to 
assert that we knew as much about things as anybody else and we were prepared to back our own judgment. I think the earlier breed had just, they, they were men and women who had grown tired. That Le Mans had tremendous relish for action and he knew that only young men could achieve that. There was in Ireland no culture of resignation uh, and uh, on the other hand you had a, uh, a lot of eager young men uh, champing at the bit, uh, waiting to get going. Right, Tommy, out we get. Now. Right, Tom. This one here first. We'll go yeah. back down, finish them out. What? Yeah. Right, Chibi. That's that. We're not taking out for an answer. Okay. They were fun. I know. You'd have to say they were fun. Mally was very funny and. I never saw him laugh, but he'd have everybody laughing. He was really great at the politics, you know, and he made great political speeches, and he was committed to getting things done. Ha, he uh, was very able, had a great sense of humour, which I find I like people who, who, who have a sense of humour. And, and Brian Lennon was brilliantly clever well, and bouncy. Yeah. So if you, if you could be at Gallows Hill, yeah. On the way into Athlone from Roscommon, yeah, yeah. about uh, quarter past eight. Yeah. yeah, and bring a few cars along to make a cavalcade. You know. No, yeah, yeah. I think we they were better the dressed than I was. Yeah. You know, they they, yeah. they had these the special the suits point. and the white yeah. cuff. I became conscious that I was at a by-election one time, and the local uh, uh, this is down the Midlands somewhere. The local man said to me, "The white cuffs were in yesterday." You know, <laughs> some of the ministers. Well, it's difficult to carry on the the dual role, of course. But a mohair suit, I think. Uh, was one of these sort of shiny suits that um, young go-ahead men wore in those days. Never wore one in my life, by the way. I'd, I think I had far better taste than ever to wear a mohair suit. It's not a check at all, it's hard cash. That sort of picture of a bunch of brass, young, mohaired, suited people, that, that's... It's a, what's it, an exaggeration to put it at its least. I mean, we were fairly sincere people and we had confidence in ourselves and we knew that things had to be done and we wanted to do the best we could for the people and we set about doing it. They spread into the papers, you know, they made friends. Donna made great friends of uh, John Healy and, and they became conscious of the media. Things were never quite the same after that because uh, Leaks, which were not a feature of Irish political life up to then, uh, became and remain uh, a feature of it. And I don't think that uh, cabinet government, for one thing, uh, is helped by that development. And of course, the RTE came in in 61, and, and we all started together with the RTE interview, so we had an equal chance. It must be remembered that, for instance, Mr. Howie was an excellent minister for justice, an excellent minister for agriculture, an excellent minister for finance. In each of these three departments, he did produce results which have proved enduring. Now, the Department of Education had been a department which had been certainly very inactive. Its tradition had been one of inactivity, and that meant that the Department of Finance had left uh, education, well, the last item in the annual budget. There was a passion for education, particularly among the working class people uh, and particularly among the mothers. I think the mothers of Ireland instinctively knew that true education was the way forward and they wanted their children to have an education in order to have opportunities that they never had. And it was quite extraordinary, their devotion to it and their passion for it. They would scrimp and save, they would sacrifice, they would go without in order that their children would get the very best possible chance through education. Free education was liberation for an entire generation of Irish school children and successive generations. This was something that was initiated outside the civil service, uh, that is by Professor Patrick Lynch and by Bill Highland, who was a statistician, and they produced a most important report, a report which provided the Minister for Education, Paddy Hillary, with the ammunition to chip away at the conservatism of the 
Department of Education. Dr. O'Rafferty. One day he came in to me and he said, you know, I met a nun who speaks for education and speaks very much for Dr. McQuaid. And she said to me, Minister, what is this minister doing making speeches about education? So I, I thought this was outrageous. But it turned out that the feeling was that the Minister of Education had one purpose, and that was to supply money and to have inspectors for standards in the system as it was. But it was a successor, Donna O'Malley, who in 1966 simply declared that there would be free education, which meant no fees, bus services for the children in the countryside to attend a secondary school. The word radical was not in my mind when I framed these proposals which I have just announced in the doll. Um, I'm a realist and I had to deal with the crying needs of our young children who thirst for education so much. O'Malley was a revolutionist in education. He saw the potential of the department where previous ministers were, were rather averse from doing anything that might arouse the church. I think the introduction of free education made a huge difference to this country. I think it was one of the factors that contributed uh, to its economic success uh, at the end of the century. Uh, without it, I don't think we could have achieved uh, what was done economically afterwards. And that's not just happening in isolation, that's happening at the same time as you're getting, for instance, the unbanning of books. So what you're saying as an official policy is that you're going to create an educated new generation and you're going to, in a sense, trust them to be citizens. That you're going to leave it to them to decide how they're going to live and you're going to take the weight of other people telling them what they can think, what they can feel, what they can read off their backs. Well, the intellectuals and writers had prepared the ground for a change on censorship. But interestingly, it was a pragmatic, canny and clever politician, Brian Lenehan, who had a stroke, simply changed uh, the legislation, allowing many books that in the past had been banned to be unbanned. The possibility of unbanning a book was introduced into the Irish bully politic. And since then, few books have been banned, and all those that were banned have pretty much been unbanned. So. Now a professor's bookshelf in a university is much the same as a university professor's bookshelf anywhere in the world. This is, remember, the same year as we're commemorating the 1916 Rising. Uh, we're in the middle of the 1960s. Kennedy has visited the country. There's a mood of optimism and prosperity. Things are looking better for the North. Continuing change uh, in the way in which people went about earning their lives. So we started to see the shift away from farming, away from small businesses to some extent, into education and training, uh, a, an emphasis on what people call human capital. I dreamt that I was back again. People begin to see different possibilities, different ways of life, different ways of doing things. I saw Love Allen's banks in the valleys down below. Young people wanted to leave the land behind. They were being drawn by the kind of multicultural world that was being offered to them in the cities. There was an old woman and she lived in the wood. Will ya, will ya, will ya? There was an old woman and she lived in the wood. Then by the river saw ya. She had a baby three months old. Dublin was this incredible mecca. There was this massive employer of people in the civil service. Industry was being focused in Dublin and in, in centralised areas. Industry had to be centralised. You couldn't spread it around uh, all over the place. Young people didn't want to stay at home on the farm to be eyed up and down by the parish priest each Sunday. They wanted to get into a place where they could be free and do what they wanted to be. Paul McCartney, John Lennon, Pringle Star, and an Irish man here, George Harrison.
my mother, she came over here, you know, because she's got hundreds of cousins and relatives over here. Yeah. And then she hasn't seen us for weeks anyway because we've been away. She so has... she's come to see the show and to see her cousins, and one of the cousins was here with her. Your mother has to come to Ireland to see you? Yeah. <laughs> It was the Fla Kjol. They began exploding throughout the 1960s and they got really got out of control. I was only at one, uh, the one in Enniscorthy, and uh, it was quite outrageous and uproarious and thoroughly enjoyable. It was a great deal of drink, quite a lot of sex, music was taking place in the background on the streets, but as far as I can remember, most people had only the very vaguest interest in the music. There were tented villages of people from all over Ireland outside the town, and it was probably a bit like it was in 1798, only much more, uh, uh, shall we say, randified. It seems to me that if you talk to people who came to their teenage years in the 1950s in Ireland and compare them with those who came to the 60s, the gap seems much greater than a decade. Uh, these are people who, at those crucial formative years, appeared almost to have been living in totally different worlds. All sorts of physical changes happening. I mean, you get supermarkets, for example, also happening in, in 1966. You get uh, the, the building of Ballymun Towers, which is the first of this new kind of urban housing in Ireland. This was at a time when system building, which is the principle along which they're constructed, was being discredited in Britain. Um, what we should have done was looked across the water and seen what mistakes were being made there and considered whether this was actually appropriate for Irish people or indeed useful as a way of building. You get the beginning of the destruction of the, of the old Dublin city. Places like Mountjoy Square, Gardner Street, all that lovely infrastructure on the north side, which was uh, the city that Joyce knew and remained that way remarkably uh, for all of those years into the 1960s. So it's, it's a moment of ignorance in a serious sort of a way that even, even though it's part, if you like, of Le Masse's forward-looking, abandon the past, pragmatic approach to things, too much is being lost. We're losing parts of the city that can't be regained and never have been regained. And that is a sad moment. And greediness starts to play its part in how the country is run, I possibly very seriously for the first time. Dublin was growing apace, and this was the period in which the church managed to build large uh, churches in suburban parts of the city, effectively meaning that the church achieved power and status in cities that it had once possessed indisputably in the countryside. And so a process of adjustment was going on in which I think the church was very successful. The Protestants marched out the church with very large books under their arms on Sundays. The Catholics went off to mass. And we didn't really mix. They had different Boy Scouts associations. The first time I was ever asked, uh, my religion was when I joined the FCA when I was 16. It just didn't enter into it. I think probably because there just weren't, there wasn't anything else but Catholics around the place, just Catholics, that's all. Trinity College was a, a mixed place. There were a lot of people who would have liked to have got into Oxford or Cambridge and got into Trinity and brought with them a lot of their habits and lifestyle. My father sought permission um, for me to go and for my two older brothers and it was to me, you know, incongruous that he would have to do that. Um, but he wanted to do it because he was very paid up and you know he saw that it was illogical but it was part of the of the order and that was the mood of the time you didn't uh, really confront uh, the structures of the establishment but uh, to me uh, part of what i gained from trinity was that there were a lot of differences in people at that time. Uh, those who came down from uh, the north who were mainly Protestant, uh, those who were from Britain, and there were a lot of them at that time, and those of us who were from Ireland, from a Catholic background, uh, had to kind of uh, stand up and be proud of what we were and who we were. When I studied in Harvard, I got uh, an incredible opportunity to see the potential of working through law, working through institutions, to make a difference, to make a change. And then coming back to Ireland and participating as uh, somebody who was younger than many of the colleagues, uh, the hat was because I was told you had to wear a hat. I hated the idea of wearing a hat, but I didn't resist. Because even then, there was a kind of conditioning 
Um, and so I wore a hat on the first day and then found it wasn't necessary and I was absolutely furious and hated that photograph of a hat. But it, it is typical that uh, even though I wanted to change things, I conformed in order to try and change um, from inside. An internal event of great importance, a diplomatic initiative by the two Prime Ministers of the separate states, Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland, Sean Lamass and Terence O'Neill. I felt it was quite crazy that uh, the two leaders in the two parts of Ireland couldn't meet and, of course, technically speaking, as you know, Northern Ireland didn't exist uh, in the Constitution of the Republic. Uh, and the mere fact that Mr. Lamas was willing to travel north to Stormont to have lunch with me, in a, in a sense, made a de facto recognition of the existence of Northern Ireland. What Lamas was saying is that there is a reality there, and there, is a cert there are certain rights there, and there is these unionist people are people that we have to talk to and we have to deal with, and we cannot drive them out into the sea. Uh, we, we must deal with them. We must deal with them for the sake of the nationalists, and we, we must deal with them also for our own sake and for, the, for their sake. So, so this was a total, it was, it was a sea change in the approach, in the mindset, but it was definitely a very high-risk uh, policy. If that had been followed up, particularly on the northern side, in the way that one would have hoped for, I think it could have transformed things. Uh, unfortunately, uh, that meeting was resented very deeply within the north and within the Unionist Party and uh, O'Neill was gone a few years later. Well, one thing that went wrong, and Terence O'Neill has rightly pointed this out, is that there was an unfortunate coincidence. The very year after Lamas met O'Neill in Stormont, we had the Golden Jubilee of 1916, which was undoubtedly celebrated with more enthusiasm in Belfast than it was in Dublin. And this encouraged um, the extremists to come out against the move towards reconciliation as being a slide into submission to the Republic. And this is what gave Dr. Paisley his beginnings in politics in the North. One of the most important events of the 1960s in Ireland was the 50th anniversary of the 1916 Rising in 1966. Now, this was taken on board by the state with enormous enthusiasm and affection. It was seen to be a legitimate celebration of our proudest moment, uh, the 1916 Rising, when a few brave men, if you like, and women, of course, established the foundation, if you like, for the establishment of the state. to belong to this nation or to belong to the people of the other island. As I've often said on many a public platform already, it would be better for Britain too that that union of the two parts of Ireland should take place. The 1916 Commemoration Committee were conscious of the general desire amongst the Irish people for that their scope and dignity uh, should further enhance the status of our nation in the eyes of the world, emphasizing both our pride in the past and confidence in the future. I hope that the arrangements which have been made uh, will be regarded as worthy of the occasion. 
the logistics of the thing were gigantic. You had pageants, parades, the, the Krog Park pageant, the insurrection program on RTE, lots of local events taking place around the country. Now, when we look at it now and think about what it meant, in hindsight, we can see the approaching nightmare of the breakout of the Troubles in Northern Ireland, which put an end, uh, up to now certainly, and, and possibly for some further time, to celebrations or commemorations of that kind, which are now tainted, if you like, retrospectively, with what has been done in the name of the leaders of 1916 uh, in the north of Ireland. I was on the Guard of Honour at the GPO uh, in Dublin for the opening and closing ceremonies of the 1916 commemorations. I was in my last year in school. I was about 18 years old. And um, it was a remarkable occasion. The entire country, it seemed to me, uh, was completely behind it. There was no questioning of any, any of the motives of the men of 1916 at that stage. Revisionism was unheard of. And there was a certain interest, I suppose, added to it in that the um, that pillar had just been blown down just a, a few weeks before. There was a line of old IRA drawn up behind us, not anywhere else, they were behind us with a flag. And uh, the various troops went by and we did our business. It was a feu de joie from the top of the GPO from the regular army. And that was it. Deplier at that stage was very old, obviously. He was quite blind. And he was the last surviving combatant of the 1916 Rising. We were aware of that. We knew that. We knew the honours had to be done. But we were also aware of the fact that he was very he was old and that he, he couldn't see us. We could see him, but he couldn't see us. And I doubt if he could see anything else that was going on. And there was something, I always thought there was something slightly symbolic about that at the time. I, I mean, I thought about it at the time, I thought about it afterwards in that here was this man, a representative of something in the past, who was coming to look at us, and yet he couldn't see us at all. It is as if we had, we'd grown away from it and, and moved away from it, even though we were paying it homage. So, in socialist language, the Irish have begun, for the first time in their history, to set a native urban industrial working class side by side with a native urban industrial property class in pursuit of wealth. One result of this is that a fascinating new class has begun to rise in Ireland, called by various names, not all of them polite, such as managers, capitalists, entrepreneurs, speculators, whiz kids, the new bourgeoisie, chancers, industrialists, new business types, the men of property, money makers, and so on. I'd like to see Ireland as a new image. Business in this town and opportunities for young people is incredible. The Irish public, I'm afraid, uh, were not sufficiently alert to the dangers of materialism creeping into politics. And no matter what warnings were given, people did not become alert to it until it all burst out into public view more recently. Fianna Fáil's uh, traditional source of income was a, a national connection that was taken up outside every Catholic church in Ireland uh, on the same Sunday every year. It gave them, I suppose, a reasonable income. Suddenly they realised that you could have a substantial source of income from businessmen which was not a traditional source of income at all. Our sections of our people, irrespective of class, of creed, or of polity. And a paraphrase from Goldsmith's deserted village. Ill fares the land to hastening ills of prey, where Blaneyites and Turkeyites accumulate and men decay. Noel Hartnett had been a member of Fianna Fáil. And he was reminiscing on his days in politics. And this event took place in the late 30s. Noel heard that Dennis Skiney, the Kerry businessman, you know, famous Dennis Skiney's shop 
Talbot Street, bought Cleary's afterwards, had made a donation to Fianna Fáil. How much it was, I don't know, but uh, it was, I believe, fairly substantial at the time. And Noel took exception to this, that business shouldn't be involved in politics. And at a meeting, I think it was a national executive meeting of Fianna Fáil, Noel protested. And Dev, De Valer stood up and he said, Mr. Hartnett, we've got to be realistic. I brought together a number of friends of mine to join a committee. And we decided that a, for the major political party in Ireland to have a committee called the Ways and Means Committee was akin to a small hockey club or rugby club or whatever. And we decided to change the name. Uh, and we decided on the name Taka. Fianna Fáil were the first party to do that. And uh, Taka was the organization that was used, um, for example, to organize lunches or dinners, uh, to invite these people to it and uh, to invite subscriptions from them. And, of course, an awful lot of things uh, flowed from that. Uh, Fianna Fáil was built on the ordinary people of Ireland, Winter and Haitia, Garan Rua, and um, those are the people who built Fianna Fáil, not the people, uh, the Taka people. There was no golden circle. There was no silver circle. In fact, there was no brass circle of any description of people around Haiti looking for favours that they should not have received. I'm absolutely positive of that. It hasn't helped me, it hasn't done any harm. Like a lot of people will say that by coming out and letting people know your political views, that this will harm your business. No, it definitely hasn't. Fianna Fáil, for a young person like me, seemed to be identified with the Irish nation, with nationalism, with the with the uh, progress and the development of the state and the country. And it all fitted into an overall picture. I mean, I was a GA person. Uh, I was an Irish language enthusiast. Uh, and uh, Fianna Fáil was a sort of a, a, a very natural way to go. I'd have put him down as the most able at the time. Tenacious, you don't know, till a person goes on a long time, you know. But he certainly focused totally on what he wanted done. And, and uh, I, I think he had uh, already developed a great group of supporters. And he was certainly uh, one of the two contesters for Tishuk when, at a certain stage, two names came up, uh, CJH and Josh Cully. And that was a competition which it was very obviously a competition between the two. They didn't like one another. There were two different kinds of people. And, and uh, one, you don't know, uh, one was very secure in the past. He's, you know, George Colley's father had been in the IRA. He, he'd been left for dead in a barricade somewhere and then found he was alive. And uh, Charlie was the new man. He, Charlie was more than a mass kind of man pragmatic. They avoided a showdown in 1966 uh, between them uh, and the showdown was avoided by uh, bringing in Jack Lynch. I often thought at the time uh, that Jack Lynch was to Fianna Fáil, a bit like uh, what John the 23rd was to the Catholic Church because he was supposed to be brought in as uh, a short-term compromise pope and uh, he in fact turned out to be one of the most influential popes of uh, certainly this century. It is true that I was reluctant to let my name go forward for nomination as Taoiseach uh, by the party. That was for personal reasons and these reasons have now been set aside and I can assure you I have no intention whatever of being a reluctant Taoiseach. Lynch turned out to be a far more significant Taoiseach having to deal with enormous and fundamental problems for this country than uh, people had anticipated. And he proved himself well able to do it, uh, and he withstood those 
uh, who thought he was a soft touch. Mr. Le Mas said that uh, a new type of patriotism is necessary now, and I think that it could be reflected simply by saying that all sections of the community must realise that they're part of the one nation, that we are part of the heritage of these people who fought for our freedom, and that unless we take advantage of it now by uh, submerging sectional interests and by ensuring that we can work together without suspicion of each other, whether on either side of the border or within either side of the border, unless we can do that, then I don't think we could be true to uh, the ideals of these people and we won't make any progress. People had, for very many years, cut off the North. They had ignored it, they turned their backs on it, they let it get on. It was a dark place with playgrounds closed on Sundays. It was a place where we knew there was probably discrimination going on, but most people decided to live with it. We just locked it off to something locked off that we couldn't deal with. Politically, I think, it was just put aside there, not ready to deal with it yet. And, and uh, this was accepted through the years by, well, certainly by all Fianna Fáil and mm, all the parties in the Dáil. Geographical unity will never solve this country's problems until we get a united people. And while people or parties like Fianna Fáil and the unionist government exist, there can be little unity of the people. There was a breakdown in Northern society and violence was coming to the fore. The unionist governments could not see their way to introduce change, the radical change that was needed to contain nationalist unrest. And you have to remember that in 1969, uh, the IRA of the time, who I didn't know, had more or less gravitated towards politics and towards socialism and had abandoned the idea of arms. I think an opportunity was missed when Le Mas went to the north. Now, people would say at that time, he'd be recognising them. But I, I think if he recognised them in their own state, living beside us, we could have done business with them. We were able to do business in London. We trade agreements with London. But there was a total wall between us and the unionists. It was a kind of hidden wall. Uh, we, we underestimated just how much discrimination there was in the North at that time. Um, we, we sort of didn't want to know. And um, I think through debates in Trinity and uh, interaction, and indeed um, going North um, to Queens at the time and, and taking part in debates, I became very aware of the sharpness of the issues of discrimination. The overall effect of, of this whole business is to overlook the fact which, as I said, Mr. de Valera mentioned, had mentioned to me 30 or 40 years before, we didn't understand the Unionist situation. Because if the Unionists are not English, where are the problems about coming to terms with them and negotiating? Do you think the, the, I... these, the difficulties arise, unfortunately, from a very, very virulent sectarianism, from a people who don't want to come to any agreement with anybody. And that's the problem we have to solve, and I don't think we can solve it on the basis of violence. When people's democracy got going, uh, it got going at about the same time as there were a lot of student demonstrations in the broader context all over Europe and in the United States in relation to the Vietnam War and in relation to lots of other things that were going on at the time. The extraordinary idealism of the civil rights movement. I mean, it was great to see what was happening at that time. It was a real opening up, and I was very aware of the importance of it, but I saw it as a civil rights movement. I didn't anticipate the armed movement that would follow. The uglier side of unionism, which we in the South had virtually ignored, the um, armed police, the B-specials, began attacking this young shoot of democracy. The power of television showed that around the world and showed it to us, perhaps more importantly, The situation in Northern Ireland was always simmering, but then the fact that it escalated into violence, I don't think anybody expected that that would happen in the way it did and to the extent that it did. This was new, this was a development that was tragic and uh, cataclysmic, but one that we just had to face up to and take aboard.
What I hadn't allowed for was the extent to which the atavistic fear unionists have of having their position undermined led them to fail to understand the civil rights movement, to see it as a threat, when all it was was people saying, I want to opt into your system after 50 years if you give me one man, one vote. It was a very modest demand. They didn't even seek to be in government. And then those who peacefully marched uh, in support of things like that and in support of the right, for example, of Catholics to uh, public housing in the North, uh, to have them hammered and beaten down as they were uh, by the RUC and by the B-Specials on behalf of the Unionist regime as it then existed at Stormont. That was pretty appalling. It wasn't aggression coming from the South or from Republicanism. It was aggression coming from not very well educated Unionists against the civil rights idea, which indicated that they did not want the minority in the North to have civil rights. That was really the kernel of that time. And unfortunately, it uh, developed into a militant business. I think the British government was really in a corner at that time. In 1969, when the violence broke out in Derry and Belfast, we were back to 1935, 1922, the problems of that period. Uh, and uh, it, it was not easy for politicians in the South to know how to deal with that. And in fact, all parties reacted very uncertainly indeed in 1969. Uh, uh, and uh, no party was prepared for it. And some people did very foolish things at the time, but nobody did very clever things at that time. Every member of the government in one way or another, uh, would have been uh, deeply, deeply involved and emotionally involved and politically concerned, and the same uh, throughout the organisation. I mean, one of the principal things that can, was always present to the minds of Fianna Fáil people, Republican Fianna Fáil party, was the Northern Ireland situation. Mm -hmm. So that naturally the whole Fianna Fáil organisation uh, would have been, would have reacted immediately, would have responded immediately to this. The ones I felt for were men in Clare who came to me, what's happening? You know, they, they again, they, were, they thought this was the time to deal with that aspect of, I suppose it was the main aspect, that was the, I suppose that's why they came in to the democratic process, the, the, the potential and promise of the Republican Party. And, and I had to talk to a lot, a lot of them and tell them I don't think this is the time for that. I think it used to be alleged against uh, Jack Lynch uh, rather surreptitiously and uh, uh, whispered rather than said out loud that he was in some way deficient on what used to be called the national question. Uh, and uh, that he wasn't as uh, fervent about it as perhaps others would be. Uh, but uh, I think he had that difficulty uh, all the time. It is clear now that the present situation cannot be allowed to continue. It is evident also that the Stormont government is no longer in control of the situation. Indeed, the present situation is the inevitable outcome of the policies pursued for decades by successive Stormont governments. It is clear also that the Irish government can no longer stand by and see innocent people injured and perhaps worse. The speech in Northern Ireland was actually reported in a more effective way and in a more scary manner in that it was reported as he had it said that the Irish government could no longer stand idly by and this implied that the Irish security forces were, which we knew were moving up towards the border in any case, uh, that they were going to invade Northern Ireland. I was in the cabinet as the parliamentary secretary and chief whip. Two members of the cabinet wanted the Irish government to be uh, much more hawkish, I suppose would be the current word. Uh, they wanted them to uh, take a much more active military role vis-a-vis uh, -vis the North. Uh, uh, the great majority of the cabinet did not want to take that uh, line. If you take into account the state of our army, the preparedness of our army to undertake anything like that, 
and uh, as against what they had in the north. Also, the fact that the public in the north had not risen against England. You know, you, 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 it wasn't anything like an opportunity that some people might have thought. And, and as far as I remember, nobody offered to lead in there. They wanted Jack to do something. I cannot myself believe that the British government could have accepted any such incursion, and they would therefore had to have been called upon to withdraw uh, governmentally, and if they'd not been withdrawn, they'd have had to have been pushed out. Now, their numbers were simply tiny compared with the resources of the British government at that time, and it would have been an extremely unpleasant and unhappy event to have taken place. Uh, and so I do not believe that it was a, a practical operation whatsoever. We, we weren't equipped to go in, and uh, we knew that perfectly well at the time. Uh, the most that could have happened, and that might have happened in a doomsday type situation, was that there uh, would have been minor or short, uh, limited excursions across the border for the purpose of getting wounded people out, and not anymore, because we weren't capable of anymore. It was a sensitive area for Fianna Fáil, because it was put in such a way as, this is what you've been waiting to do. This is why we held ourselves back. This is why we put up with debts during the 40s and for De Valera. And are you going against that? A report was clearly passed to Mr. Cosgrave, amongst others. Um, and at that stage, um, the government in Dublin had to take those matters seriously. And some answer had to be made. It was, it was too strong, too circumstantial to, to be brushed aside. The fact is that the evidence that Mr. Cosgrave produced was correct, and I doubt very much that he produced that himself. Well, I don't know myself, obviously, where Mr. Cosgrave got it from, but my guess would be uh, that he got it from within the state and probably from within the guards. The real crisis came then when one, one day Jack, at a meeting, said, you know, I don't want any ministers involved in dealing with guns and things like that. Or so, you know, he, I thought it was all over whatever he was dealing with, that he had dealt with it. And then the thing broke out, the doll, and he, he had to take action. But it has been suggested that gun running uh, was the, the, the basic cause. Have you anything to say about that? That was mentioned, all right. Well, I think Mr. Lynch was not given all the information that he should have been, and in particular, he was not given it by the then Minister for Justice, Mr. O'Mora. Jack had to take a decision to remove some ministers from the government. And when I was rung by Marish McAneil at 4 a.m. to say that Hawhey and Blaney had been sacked, I was very taken aback. Blaney, I could understand. Hawhey, I found very surprising. Um, uh, and uh, very puzzling, as most people did at the time, as to why, how he became involved and why he became involved in that process. When I heard that uh, Mr. Hawhey was involved, I, I was absolutely astonished. I, I was flabbergasted. I had very, very uh, strong uh, connections with the north of Ireland. Both my mother and father came from Northern Ireland. Uh, I had uh, very, very extended family in Northern Ireland. At one time I, I counted I had 50 first cousins. We, um, my mother's side of the family were a very long-tailed family. I had 50 first cousins living in Northern Ireland, apart from uncles and aunts and so on. So I was very, uh, as a family we were deeply embedded in the Northern Ireland situation. There have been hints in the morning papers that uh, some of you might even be associated with gun running into Northern Ireland. Is there any truth at all in this? Well, you, can't deal, you can't deal with rumours. The, the T-shirt, as far as I know, didn't say anything about that. No, it's in the morning papers, merely as a rumour. Ah, well. There was always an element of atavistic nationalism in Fianna Fáil, which could be aroused by events, and the events in the North aroused it amongst some members there. Others had a much more rational and clear view, uh, but the party was very divided on the issue, and those divisions led to the arms importation, the arms crisis. It was people trying to respond, in a, but, but not wanting to respond, feeling a sense of duty, because you couldn't but feel, I was getting telephone calls from Belfast, you couldn't but feel tremendous sympathy 
with people who felt that they were going to be attacked. You know, nevertheless, you, you had to consider other aspects of it. That if you, as a state, got involved in this situation, then you'd never see the end of the civil war that would result. Oh, well, there's no crisis that the government is continuing and I'll not make my new nominations tomorrow. It was uh, important that somebody would be appointed uh, after uh, Morn was asked to retire that could be relied on to convey all important information immediately. Will the government be invoking the Special Powers Act, do you think? We've made a statement. I've no, I'm afraid I can't say any more. I regret at this stage. There's no more to be said. This is a social occasion. Any further arrests? Any further that I'd to say would be said in the door. You make a full disclosure in the door. The people who were involved had so alienated themselves from what was the official policy of Fianna Fáil that they could not be immediately reinstated in government. They were defiant, they were unapologetic, they would not accept the leadership of Lee Lynch. And they continued uh, to sort of behave in that vein outside, with the exception of Charles Hockey, who took his medicine. I feel absolutely confident that Mr Lynch will understand what has been done here today. That justice has been done. They have got their answer today and I hope they realise it and take the appropriate action. After. What action is that? That is to make way for those who believe in a Republican Party running this country yes. and not the sort that we're developing at the moment. Those who are responsible for the debacle have no alternative now but to take the honourable course which is open to them. I had another reason to believe that he had to stay in competition for Tishuk. He, he was found innocent, as you know, but he went through that great trauma. But uh, he wasn't a man to make a mistake in, in any of the things he undertook. And when he, he was removed from office, I think he did everything the right way after to make sure he got back. You know, he, he, he didn't preach any other Gospels, try to set up any other party. And a long period, which very suffering for a man like him, until he did get back into government. I was glad that I didn't have to do what Jack Lynch did, because you needed to be physically and mentally very strong to do what he did. He was an enormously popular man and an enormously successful athlete. And I mean, he had things building him up to that. When he left the doll, uh, Liam Cosgrove said he was the most popular man since Daniel O'Connell. And he put that out there in front of, you know, all these waves of excitement. There can be no compromise in fundamental policy. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I think history will eventually give credit to Jack Lynch where it was due. And that was particularly, of course, during the, the arms trial and the, the huge difficulties then, and the outbreak more so of hostilities, if we call them that, in, in, in Northern Ireland. They say Jack was a softy, but he put his foot down on that. I think anybody from Limerick or Tipperary who'd played hurling against Jack Lynch would know there was a bit of steel there. Mm. Might have been quite as obvious in political circles in Fianna Fáil, but um, hurlers who had stood up against him would have known that. Jack phoned me uh, and asked me would I act as secretary uh, because Kevin had resigned. So I, I rambled in, uh, and that's the way to put it, thinking, you know, I'm just secretary, I'm just sitting there. Paddy Smith was in the chair. And uh, next thing I saw that all the anti-Lynch people were lined up in a queue. There was going to get no speaker in favour of him, and that wasn't looking so good. Jack says, you'll answer the debate which was, uh, well, uh, that was it. I, I, I was told to answer the debate. And having heard uh, a big, big number of them, Smith decided that's enough. I was called on to speak. Yeah, I suppose I let fly. And we will continue that policy in spite of any bully boys within or without the organisation. We can have elections for our Officers, but we won't frighten Jack Lynch out of here by a few bully boys.
It's hands in there! Not over there! And Fianna Fáil will survive as it did before! You can have Boland, but you can't have Fianna Fáil! After that, our dish, I called to see Lamas. He was in hospital. And he said to me, uh, Jack Lynch has full control of his party now. That was his assessment.